Hello, my dear Northeastern sisters. My name is Megan May. I am a church planter's wife in the DC area near Dulles Airport. I have five kids and I wanted to introduce myself to you. I just stepped into this role March 12th following our beloved sister, Janie Ann Wilson. Um, and as I stepped into this role, we began to experience what is now known as the pandemic coronavirus. Over the next few uh, weeks or longer, I would like to introduce you to some more women in our region who are hoping to share with you some treasures of faith that they are clinging to in the midst of this time. Today, I'm gonna to share with you a little bit about our gospel footing and suffering and um, the Father that we have who invites us to come to him in the midst of the darkness and who um, is not afraid of our lament and our grief. I want to share a story with you that I had read about. Um, it was about a young pastor who was visiting one of his parishioners and who noticed a large round stone on the floor uh, that was engraved with the words, the moon is round. And this is kind of a reminder that I have on my desk that unless my two-year-old son has not has taken it and is running around with a ball um, or what he thinks is a really cool glowing ball. But um, it reminds me that the moon is always round as well. Um, the pastor had asked the woman about it and she said that a young friend of hers who had died of cancer at the age of 14 had written that in a journal um, to remind herself that even though she couldn't see the whole moon in the dark circumstances that she was facing, that God was always good. The moon was always round. And so I want to remind you of that today as you are facing the uncertainty of the times that we're in. Um, prayer is an invitation to grow in our relationship with God, and he invites us to pray our joys and our sorrows. And that is an encouragement to us in the midst of these days. Because we live in the already and the not yet, we experience the brokenness of the fall while we also taste the coming redemption. We all know that the darkness and the reality of the fall is real. But in Psalm 56, 8, we read that God has kept count of our tossings. He has put our tears in his bottle and they are in his book. I have a two-year-old son and he does not like to be alone in the dark at night. Um, we just switched him from a crib to a toddler bed. So now if he wakes up in the middle of the night and realizes that we're not there, he cries out and wants us to come and snuggle with him. He does not like the darkness, but there is a moment in the dark where he cries and it turns into a, a sound of joy. And that's the moment he scooped into my husband, his father's arms. He immediately feels safe and cared for and the darkness doesn't frighten him anymore. When his daddy's there, he knows that he is secure. In Psalm 130, which is a Psalm of Ascent, we read, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, which is the covenant name for our God who is in a faithful, loving relationship with us. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O oh, Israel, which is a call for all of us, everyone, hope in the Lord. For the Lord, with the Lord, there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. Like my son, we are learning to wait and to trust that our Father is there and that he will show up. But in a culture conditioned to believe that fast is best, there is nothing harder for us than waiting. Recently in a Bible study that I'm in, we talked about how the verb associated with waiting patiently for the Lord is actually the word of an expectant mother who's waiting to give birth in the midst of sharp labor pains. Um, and so that's a whole different kind of waiting. It's a type of active waiting, which is painful, but purposeful and full of hope. We are expectant, like watchmen on the wall, guarding the city overnight, but who know that morning is coming. God answers our cries in the dark different than anyone else can. And a sufferer's most basic need is to hear God answering them particularly and to see him purposely at work. Our Father hears our cries and comes to our aid in the midst of the darkness, and he cares uniquely for us. His presence reveals his love. I will give you the treasure of darkness and hordes in secret places. 
that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. God sits in the dark with us and he calls us by our name. He reminds us who we are and most importantly, he reminds us that he loves us. He is our God and we are his people. God, the all-powerful one who spoke life into existence by his word, is the one who calls us by name. And into our suffering, he sends personal help. A person, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, came into our darkness from heaven. And then he lived a perfect life. He died a death on our behalf. He overcame the darkness after three days and rose again and calls us to follow him. And then he sends his spirit to live within us. And as his spirit is at work inside us, he's revealing his strength in our weakness. Growing in dependence upon God, especially through prayer, looks a lot like gathering daily bread or manna. It's a daily lesson in trust. And that's what we are invited to right now, my friends. Manna provided all the nourishment the Israelites needed as they wandered the wilderness, but it had to be gathered fresh each day. And so I'm hoping that we'll do that together as we listen to other sisters in our region share their hope. The Psalms model this for us. They remind us of the story that we are in, and we see the psalmist press into that story as they face difficult circumstances. They press into who they know God is, who he's revealed himself to be, and all of his faithful acts in the past that are a source of hope for the future. They know that his presence and his promises are real. The Psalms were the prayer book of God's people as they attempted to remain faithful to the commands of God and waited for the Messiah. It was a mini book of scripture that was divided into five books that reflected the five books of the Torah. More than half of the book of Psalms is actually composed of laments. But there's a progression through those five books, and by the end, there's actually more praise than lament. God welcomes your laments. The Psalms help us to see what it looks like to wrestle with our faith in the midst of challenging trials. The psalmists wrestle with a range of fears, hopes, doubts, and questions with God, but they pray their situation instead of merely thinking about it on their own. Laments are expressions of faith that are disguised behind tears and fears, and it's a lost art, but it's one that I hope that we can practice again. Our first sound when we are born is a cry, and we will cry many more times throughout our life. And our Father, who cares deeply, encourages us to express our grief with cries and questions. He's big enough to handle them, just like he was big enough to wrestle with Jacob. And do you know that we are named, God's people were named Israel, after Jacob, the one who wrestles with God? Lament is the language of those who acknowledge the present darkness and wait for the splendor of the morning. By the strength of our faith, we're invited to lament and take our cares directly to God, sharing what we are experiencing, and it keeps us from having a barrier to our relationship with God. In A Loving Life, Paul Miller graciously shares a story about his autistic daughter, Kim, who was pacing early in the morning. He said that his wife, Jill, would yell at Kim to go back to bed while he just ignored it and tried to sleep. On the surface, he says, Jill's yelling seemed less spiritual than my silence, but the opposite is true. Jill was passionately engaged with something that wasn't working, and I shut it out. God can work with the former, but not the latter. He can work with something that is moving, but not when our hearts are literally under the pillow. He also says lament doesn't drift into unbelief or cynicism, which turn from God and his promises, but it engages with what is wrong. So it risks standing in the gap of what we believe about our present circumstances and asking God to make his presence known. And it invites us to trust and struggle, to grieve and believe. I want to take a quick moment to look at Psalm 77 with you and take note of some of what we've been talking about in, in this psalm together. Psalm 77 displays faith in action and in waiting. It says, I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord, 
and in the night my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Selah, which is rest. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Selah. And in these first ver verses, the psalmist is sharing all of his doubts and fears or hers and disappointments that he feels with God. I say or hers because I want to invite you to do the same. Instead of allowing his feelings to hang over him, he untangles the jumble of them and names his doubts and fears. He lays his painful feelings before the Lord. And in verses 10 through 13, we see that there's a shift. He says, then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember the wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? So he starts talking to himself and not just listening to himself and the things that are rattling around on his head. He begins to remind himself of his relationship with God. And as he stops rehearsing what's in his head on loop, he tells himself what he knows to be true. And he looks to what he knows um, what he's seen in the character of God on display. In verse 11, there was a shift. And it's as if the psalmist stops and turns around and looks at the path that he has already walked. And he recalls the Ebenezer stones. In fact, this psalmist looks past his own experiences with God to recall how God has walked with his people who were before him and cared for them in their own days of trouble. That is courageous faith. He unloads his doubts, his desires, his fears, and hopes, and makes room to recall how God has been present with his people in times of trouble. He begins not only to rest in who God is, but to praise God for his faithfulness, even in the midst of the current difficulty. And that's what we see as the psalm ends. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people the children of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. When the water saw you, O God, when the water saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightning lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea your path through the great water. So it's not that you get, you don't have to walk those paths, but he's with you along that way. Yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The psalmist saw God's strength, which gave the psalmist permission to be weak. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. So lament does not minimize our difficulty, but searches the horizon for signs of the faithful rescuer. Your difficulty today is your classroom. That's something I heard Melissa Kruger say once. And God is teaching you. I invite you to turn inward struggles into outward pleas for help. And as your beliefs begin the arduous journey of wrestling themselves from your head to your heart, I want to walk with you. Let's have our hurts and heartache transform into living hope as we encounter the living God. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Thank you, sisters. And I look forward to being with you and serving you and hopefully encouraging and equipping you 
over the coming season together. And um, I send my love and remind you that God is present with us, even in these circumstances.